Well, Dr. Holly Graham is an associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Saskatchewan, a member of the Thunderchild First Nation, and Dr. Graham has worked as a registered nurse in northern communities for years. She now works as a psychologist, working primarily with people who have experienced trauma and PTSD. One of the tools she uses is called EMDR. Well, today we're going to learn more about the therapy known as eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, or EMDR. And of course, we want to hear from you. If you've received therapy for trauma or PTSD, what worked for you and what didn't? Dr. Graham, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for inviting me. Um, What what drew you to wanting to become a, a a trauma therapist in the first place? Um, well, there's uh, many things. It's always multifaceted, but I was worked as a psychiatric nurse for three years in um, Dallas, Texas, and it really became apparent to me that when people were suffering with mental health that they really were totally incapacitated and unable to take care of their physical wellness. And being a nurse, then I was more so drawn to if I wanted to impact health and wellness, the importance of integrating uh, mental health and wellness, and that really consolidated that that uh, that background and that perception, mm-hmm. and then the desire to pursue more uh, training and education in mental health. Yeah. How how do you define trauma and PTSD? Um, there's many different definitions of trauma, and very simply, I look at it any experience that overwhelms a person's capacity to cope, and that would be different for someone who is three years old versus someone who's a youth, perhaps adult, or later in life. Um, I always let my clients describe what's been traumatic for them because it's their experience. And if I want to be of best assistance, then I have to start from their reference, what they define as traumatic and what has impacted their life. Uh, just, just for the sake of the conversation today, do you differentiate between PTSD and trauma? Like, do you see PTSD as a, a subset of trauma? Um, I just like to clarify first that I don't diagnose PTSD, okay. and I work with symptoms of uh, PTSD, and I have seen many individuals who have been diagnosed with PTSD. Everyone I've seen with PTSD does have a history of background to date in my practice. Okay, so prior so, to that event occurring, yeah, so, in which so the, we don't have to differentiate between PTSD and and other forms of trauma, since trauma is at the root of PTSD, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, what are the most common causes of trauma? That, that you see in your practice? What I see in my practice is often related to adverse childhood experiences. So I see many with complex PTSD, meaning that the trauma started early in their childhood before they're 18 years of age, most common. And sometimes I see people who come in who um, have had a recent loss, perhaps uh, chronic grief and loss, they've had multiple losses, often divorce, infidelity, depression, anxiety. Those would be the most common. Let's talk about treatments. What are some of the most common therapeutic treatments for trauma? Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is the gold standard. And that's okay, what's that? Cognitive behavioral therapy. That's looking at some how people think and have thoughts about events that have happened to them and looking at their behavioral responses to it and what they do to deal with those thoughts that they have and even with those uncomfortable body sensations that come with thoughts that we have from events that have happened. And so it's, it's looking at it... Um, I suppose from a pragmatic point of view of what are the thoughts that are you're having and then working with the thoughts and looking at changing behavior. If you can change behavior, often there'll be some change in your thoughts or vice versa. So it's very connected what mm-hmm. we think and what we do. Uh, we're focusing today on EMDR or eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. In a nutshell, what is that? In a nutshell, it's... Um, I know when you look at the literature, it says it's relatively new, but it was actually first discovered and brought to our attention in 1989 by Dr. Francine Shapiro. She was a a psychologist, and she had a very um, distressing event, which we don't know what it is, and she went for a walk and noticed afterwards she felt much better. And when she went back and retraced her steps, there were a lot of butterflies, and her eyes had been moving. And she made the connection with eye movement and processing and being able to resolve and perhaps uh, problem-solve with events. And she started the study of research that then started to what we know today as the foundation of EMDR. So that was 1989. Is it it rapid eye movement or just random eye movement or...? She says now if she were to name it, she would have named it an adaptive information processing approach versus 
eye movement because many uh, there are many instances where uh, you cannot say use eye movement and you have to use other uh, other modalities for bilateral stimulation such as auditory or tactile um, to elicit the bilateral stimulation within the person while they're processing. I want to bring our, our first caller into the conversation. Keith in Saskatoon has had this treatment, and uh, he's on the line now. Hi, Keith. Hello. Um, yeah, I had uh, one, only one EMDR session about 10 years ago by a psychologist in Saskatoon for PTSD. Um, the session was, they were always one hour uh, with him for, for other things, but um, it felt like 10 minutes. So it's not, but it wasn't hypnotism, but it felt really short because it Parts of it I don't remember, but um, it was something that was obviously bothering me um, quite a lot. Um, and and afterwards, it's never it's never been an issue since. So it worked fine for me. Yeah. What t- tell us tell us more about uh, what was your initial reaction? I guess when this treatment was was suggested. Well, <clears throat> he he just suggested that let's give this a try. <clears throat> it was near the beginning of the session. I think it was our our second or third session. <clears throat> and then I said, yeah, sure. And then he hooked me up to all these different things and did, did the eye movement, did the other stuff. I can't remember all the details. But he was asking me questions before he did it. And, and I was getting quite anxious and, and, uh, and angry about some of the questions. And then after, he asked me the same questions. And I stopped myself and said, I don't care. <laughs> That doesn't bother me. It was so weird. And uh, I looked at him like, how come, you know, whatever, it seemed like 10 minutes ago, but I guess it was an hour, that this really bothered me. And then all of a sudden, I don't care about this issue. And he just winked at me because the session was over, and he said, uh, I'll explain next week. Uh, and so he did. He explained it next week how he had gone in, somehow this works, and basically reprogrammed something in my brain that was in there. <laughs> the way he drew it in a picture, it looked like some black spot inside my brain, and he, and somehow this process just takes that out, and it worked. Uh, it was amazing. How have you felt since that treatment? Did it, was it a kind of a one-time, you're fixed thing? Or? It was a one one-time session. The, the The issue that I had for the PTSD was was a, a, a situation that had happened. Um, many years before, but never really could deal with it. And every once in a while it would flare up. And sometimes it would flare up to where I got very, very, very angry and wanted to do something. And and I and my one of my kids said, you should go, you should go see your psychologist and figure that out. And so I did. And I told him and he, and he said, let's give this a try. And sure enough, <laughs> it worked. Uh, yeah. But I also wanted to mention... Um, I don't know if if, if uh, this is not part of this conversation, but I find that mushrooms and LSD, uh, not like on a regular basis, but even one time, also is a is a is a thing that's helped mm-hmm. some people that I know. Mm-hmm. So that's something else. But yeah, EMDR worked for me one right. time. Keith, thanks so not much for taking but... thanks so much for taking part in the conversation today, Keith. Thank you for telling us your story. Yeah, yeah no problem. Uh, doctor, what are your thoughts on what Keith tell? told us. Well, thank you, Keith, for sharing that. And, and um, I'd like to talk a little bit, we said about the black dot. One way that was described for me by someone who's done EMDR for 30 years, a very long time, is if you think of an unprocessed memory or event that's happened as like a lump of butter sitting in the middle of your brain, it's unable to process it. And every time you think something, it can be triggered or activated. When you do the EMDR processing, it's like that's melting. And the melting really represents the uh, reprocessing and then the memory being reconsolidated into a more adaptive form. And so then it is actually um, integrated within our memory networks uh, as less disturbing. So that uh, black dot is one way to describe it. But you don't actually have a black dot in your brain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just an image. Do, uh, it appears that the consensus is that this works. Do we have any idea why or how? That's a really good question because we really don't know for sure. There's different um, uh, possibilities that have been brought forward. Uh, one is that it simulates very much like rapid eye movement, which happens when we sleep, mm-hmm. and that's our body's natural mechanism for processing what happens during the day and making sense. That's what happens with events that are not as traumatic. Um, 
Another theory I've heard is that it's stimulating um, the working memory. So when you bring a trauma and you're talking to it, you're bringing it into working memory, which is in the here and now. And when it's um, the story, the narrative is um, heard, validated, uh, some positive uh, cognitive interweaves may be necessary because the current scheme of how they see the world and their experiences doesn't allow them to see other factors involved in the event. Then with that... Um, working memory, then when it's reconsolidating the memory, it's less disturbing. So that speaks to the potential that when someone's sharing their, tom their trauma, there's the potential to re-traumatize or further traumatize, mm -hmm. depending on the audience who hears the story. All right. I want to bring uh, Agnes into the conversation in Saskatoon. Hi, Agnes. Hello. Hi. Uh, go, go ahead, Agnes. Tell us your, your story. <clears throat> um. Yes, in 2018, <clears throat> I had um, actually met with Holly. She was my therapist. Hi, all. Hi, Holly. <laughs> and um, I uh, went through, <clears throat> I don't know, I, I think I had a several incidents that brought me to a point where my anxiety was um, at an extreme <clears throat> level where I was almost becoming non-able um, to function. And so I met with Holly, and we went... I took me through um, the EMDR process, and I think my therapy was about seven months, and um, it just really helped my anxiety um, because I was at a point where I didn't know what I was going to do. And CBT wasn't helping, um, and I just needed to take it down to where the root of the trauma was, and I had had several traumatic incidents throughout my lifetime. And so um, since then, whenever, if I do get anxiety, I can pinpoint it exactly to the situation. And um, it's like a switch. Like, it doesn't stay on anymore all the time. It, I, you know, I have more control over my ability to cope. You, you mentioned that it was over the course of seven months. What did you uh -huh. feel like at the end compared to the beginning? Um, <clears throat> I felt more confident. Um, I felt more in control of my my ability to handle situations. Um, I didn't feel as like I was in threat mode all the time. Um, I had more clarity. Um, I could focus more, and I could rationalize things better. And I wasn't so reactionary to situations. Have the effects in your experience been long term? Um, yes. Yes. Um, there's, yeah. yeah. Holly, did you want to weigh uh, in here? Sure. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, one of the things that happens when we have these particularly early experiences or anything that's traumatic, in fact, is we can tend to uh, internalize a negative cognition. I'm not lovable. I'm not worthy. I'm undeserving. Something of that nature. And when we do the MDR um approach, we're actually addressing the, how the person thinks about themselves, um, the body sensations, so the physical sensations, and also the emotions. So it's actually a whole body approach. And, and when you look at uh, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, EMDR is classified as a form under CBT of desensitization because you're going directly into the trauma mm -hmm. and um, moving through that process. Okay. Agnes, thank you so much for calling today. Thanks for sharing your story. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you again, Agnes. Um, how, how do, is, is, this a, is this sort of a one-time treatment, or is this something that has to be repeated, you know, annually or, or biannually or, or, or biweekly for a number of months or years, or, or how does that work with EMDR? It really depends. It varies from person to person, and it depends how much trauma they've had before and perhaps uh, adverse childhood experiences come into play. Um, on average, if someone has what I'm seeing as a more relatively trauma history, which unfortunately is quite common, I'm looking at probably 20 hours. But 20 hours involves going right back to initial attachment uh, with primary caregivers, whether that be about biological parents or adoptive parents or some other type of kinship, and goes looks at bullying, um, could even include perhaps loss of a pet, 
there are some of these events that we look at as an adult, and we don't necessarily categorize them as um, traumatizing, but they can very much be to a, a young child's brain that's developing, and the child's brain is more likely to um, internalize a negative cognition of somehow I'm responsible, I'm the reason this is happening. And that's what EMDR, when I'm doing it, is I look at those early events and I'm paying very close attention to the negative cognitions that have been internalized along with the somatic experience, the body experience. So, uh, again, though, is, is a, a course of treatment that, that happens once or twice? And, I mean, you, you mentioned a 20-hour course. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> or or does it, is it something that somebody's going to have to repeat at, at some interval for, you know, the rest of their lives? Generally, once I've processed an event with a client, it's done. But I have had clients when they've had a lot of medication, and so we've processed an event, and then when their psychiatrist has lowered their medication, I'll have to reprocess. Okay. Because I can't, they can't access the, um, the, uh, the, their feelings through their true depth and, and their body sensations when they're medicated. But that is often so necessary to stabilize a person. So I've done that. So in that sense, I have to reprocess. Other than that, no. Now, there are some instances of, say, if someone had a very traumatic event in which they sustained a concussion, mm -hmm. and there's a chance that, say, they go riding on a dune buggy several years later, there's that potential that the jarring could link back to that trauma, and then you would have to just continue processing. It's not reprocessing. It's just sometimes the brain is not ready to give everything to be reprocessed. That is the beauty of EMDR is as a therapist or psychologist, I can't control the brain will allow me in the session to process what that person is ready and can tolerate for the most part. Um, what what got you interested in, in this court in this treatment in the first place? Um, well, that would go to my personal experience. Uh, I basically became a registered nurse. I was about 19 years old. But my childhood, when you look at first childhood experiences, I had a very high score. And one of my parents attended residential schools, so I had been exposed to a lot of adverse um, events that had happened throughout. But I was able to function and able to go to school and do very well. And then when I was living out of the country, um, I had a very violent physical assault. Uh, and it ended in my marriage ending as well. And that was when I decided that I really needed to go and talk to someone. And my ex-husband... Um, is a chiropractor, and he said, there's this amazing psychologist. I send all my patients to her because after driving and all the accidents, many of his patients weren't able mm -hmm. to drive because they had PTSD and symptoms similar. And so he said, I think, you know, go see her. She's got a 99%, he said, success rate, and I don't know anyone else like her. So I went to see her, and she at that time was in Saskatchewan, and she did EMDR. So that was back in 1999. Uh, when I did that. So I did my work and I was, it changed my life. And um, I thought this is an incredible tool that I had never heard of. And I was a nurse and I had just worked three years as a psych nurse and no one had ever spoke about it. And then I decided that I would come back and do a master's and a PhD so I could provide this to yeah. people in Saskatchewan. What, what did it do for you personally? Um, if I were to be, um, it addressed the negative cognitions. I grew up, um, experiencing uh, racism and poverty and had internalized a lot of those negative messages, not feeling worthy and not lovable, feeling that most of what happened was my fault. And it really, um, it helped change the schema. We talk about the schema of how my thoughts were arranged. And it really um, allowed that process of my brain to see things differently. So the child's brain is different than the adult brain. And I think that's the beauty of working with adults when you do EMDR is the, the adult brain, the frontal lobe, is finished growing and developing about 26, 27 years of age. So you have the capacity to have problem solving and looking at consequences. But as a child, your child's brain doesn't have that capacity. And so it was really that opportunity for me to really look at most of what had happened was not my fault and that I am lovable and that I am worthy. And that's what really changed was that for me. What, what's been the biggest change... I, I guess, in, in, in your life since since the treatment? I, mean, I, I would just say just feeling that I'm okay yeah. and, and understanding that uh, hurt people hurt people and understanding when people lash out that that is not necessarily anything to do with me but everything to do with what their experiences have been and particularly what's going on for them that day. Able to create that distance to see clearly 
you know, what is my stuff that I need to address and what is not my stuff. Okay, back to today's conversation. We're talking about uh, treatments for trauma, PTSD uh, among them. And particularly today, we're talking about something called EMDR. And uh, our guest today uh, practices the uh, the treatment with uh, with her patients. And we'd love to hear from you today, folks. If this is something you have uh, tried, I'm going to move on. I'm going to bring our next guest into the conversation in just a moment. But I want to share this uh, email from Megan. Megan writes, I was wondering if this technique would work on a nine-year-old child who has a phobia of needles. Nothing traumatic has ever happened to her with needles, but she has such a fear that she's unable to receive needles without being basically pinned down. Right? The, I, I don't know if that's more a phobia than a, than a trauma, but uh, to, to, uh, to the heart of Megan's question, does this work on children? You were telling us about the difference between a child's brain and an adult's brain. Would this work on a, on a child who's recovering from tra- trauma? Yes, EMDR, you can use it with children as well. It's been done with children as young as two years old. So, yes, it does work with children, and it can work with children. In terms of phobias or anxiety, yes, you can use EMDR to, to address that. Yeah, okay. I've uh, worked with someone who had a phobia of flying, mm-hmm. was unable, unable to get into an airplane. Did it work? Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> That was the homework, to go take a trip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our, our next guest has experience with EMDR from uh, a patient's perspective. Steve Glody retired from the RCMP back in 2019 after 27 years on the force. His time with the RCMP left him with post-traumatic stress disorder and searching for anything to help his PTSD and depression. One of the avenues he pursued was EMDR. He's in our Regina studio to tell us more. Steve, uh, welcome back to the program. Hey, thank you very much, Garth. Uh, we know that the first responders, uh, police officers among them, experience higher rates of PTSD. What toll did your work take on you after 27 years? Uh, it took a uh, it took a big toll on me. I actually went quote unquote broke in 2015, and I remember that time very clearly. I was in the shower and I uh, broke down crying because it came down to a life and death moment. And from that point on, it's been a journey of recovery because at that moment I realized I wanted to live and not wanted to die. Is that what you meant by a live or die moment? It a- was, absolutely. Yeah. It was what at that were you moment. Going to do? It was a choice, either, you know, what I was going to take my own life or I was going to continue to fight. And I had too many reasons to stay. Uh, father of four, lovely wife, um, and I wanted to stay. And that meant going down this long journey of recovery. And EMDR played a very important part in that. How, how did you know that you needed professional help? What, what was the, the trigger? Uh, in, the, in the world of policing in particular and in the RCMP, I mean, let's remember there was a time when, uh, you know, psychological injuries were not a thing to be spoken about. And you would go to these <laughs> medicals every so often, force medicals, and very seldom did you ever tell the truth, <laughs> ironically, when it came to your mental health um, and there's a longer process to that when you look back on how the force dealt with things to when we used to drink as, as a form of trying to deal with this stuff to the point when the drinking stopped across the country and the detachments after work. And uh, then we were kind of left without anything. And I'm not advocating drinking by any stretch, but at the time, that's what we would deal with. And then in 2015, when I broke, I knew I was in real trouble. And that led me down a journey where... I ended up doing, uh, well, if you like, Garth, I can explain to you how I came across EMDR. Well, sure. Let's, let's go there. All right. Let's go there, Steve. So in 2019 and 20, I spent nine weeks in an in-treatment program out of British Columbia. And the program was designed specifically for PTSD, anxiety, and depression, and first, you know, first responders, veterans. And uh, at the end of that nine weeks, I was... Uh, I was in really bad shape, and I think it was only because the amount of trauma that one experienced in in my case, I was just starting to really scratch the surface and get into this raw, really emotional part that I've never really dealt with before. Now, prior to this, for me, suicidal thoughts were as common as human breathing. I would wrestle these thoughts for as long as I can remember. I can't I can't tell you, oh, this started back then, but it was always suicidal thoughts. Now, it's important to realize I I recognize the difference between thoughts versus actions. I didn't want to kill myself, but I couldn't stop 
thinking about it all the time for as long as I can remember. And when I went to this in-treatment program near the, v- the very last four or five days, somebody mentioned EMDR. Now, of course, I'm grasping for every straw I can possibly get, like reaching for that uh, inflatable tube if you were floating in an ocean kind of thing. And I was grabbing anything I could. And when I heard about this, I'm like, oh, what's that? And I listened to them talk. Now, granted, being in an in-treatment program, (laughs) you're obviously inside a facility. So I had a chance to learn a little bit. And then I went and talked to one of the psychiatrists about the EMDR because there was only one of the... I forget, four or five psychiatrists on staff that did EMDR. And of course, it was in my final day, so it was too late for me. But uh, she did an example with me, and she sat with me. And her way of doing it was she would get right up into your personal space where you're facing each other. And as she talked, her way of doing it was tapping on your knee at whatever point that probably Holly could articulate a lot better as to why. But at a certain point, she'd start tapping on my knee. Now, I thought this was weird, very uncomfortable, but I had no choice. So I ended up coming back to Regina, and I was, like I said, I was a mess. And I have a great psychologist here in the city. And when I was telling her about this, she said, you know, I know another psychologist that does EMDR. And so uh, she put me in touch with her, and I started to see her. Now, keep in mind, um, again, I... Uh, When I tell you that it was on my mind all the time, I am not lying one bit. It consumed me. So I, much like some of your callers described, didn't know exactly what this was, even though I sort of experienced it and tried to research it. I still couldn't make sense out of it, but I was desperate, and I went. And again, another point maybe Holly could speak of, my psychologist at the time says, let's stop doing what we do, and you just focus on the EMDR, and then when you're done your EMDR sessions... Whenever that'll be, then you'll come back to your regular psychologist sessions. So I went, I did these. Now, after my my psychologist, instead of tapping on the knee, which I was glad she didn't do, she, uh, I'm going to say this wrong, a hair scrunchy, a hair uh, (laughs) scrunchy, a hair scrunchy, Mm -hmm. that's the thing. She had like the, remember the old antennas on our cars, you'd you'd close them (laughs) and open them up and then you know, compress into a little tiny thing. She had sort of one of those and she'd open it up and she'd tie one of these hair scrunchies on the end of it and she'd run me through the session. And at whatever point that she deemed, I guess it was time to activate it, she would start moving the antenna and I would focus on this hair scrunchie and she'd move it in different directions and do different things. And I thought this stuff is all weird, but I have no choice. (laughs) I need to try it. And I was in for every inch of me. Garth, after 13 sessions, I, can, I don't know how, but I can honestly tell you I had clarity in my head again. I had clarity in the sense where I wasn't being consumed by these suicidal thoughts that were constantly consuming my mind. And after 13 sessions, I don't know how. Obviously, it's a reprogramming of the, the mind somehow, but they just went away. Now, sometimes they come back here and there on the, on the short term, but nothing. It was, it was a game changer. It was a game changer and one huge step in my recovery process. So, yeah, it was pretty amazing. Why do you think it worked, Steve? Wow, that's a really great question. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not smart enough <laughs> to probably answer that on, on the whole psychological side of things. But uh, I did trust in the psychologist that was doing it. And I did put 100% effort behind it. I followed whatever direction she told me to do, and I embraced it. And it worked, and I'm not sure how, but it, uh, it was a game changer for me, and I would highly recommend that for uh, anybody. Now, it didn't cure everything, but it did cure what we were working on, and that was to try to stop the suicidal thoughts. And I didn't think it was possible, but I'm here to tell you it is. Yeah. No, Steve, we, we've talked before about your passion for helping other first responders deal with workplace trauma and PTSD. What message do you have for someone listening right now who might be struggling? Hey, first and foremost, never give up. Never, ever give up. And then try everything that you have available to you to try in your fight to live and survive. Because you can survive 
PTSD and anxiety, depression. You survive and you can thrive. But you, again, being a veteran in this country, we're fortunate where we have a lot more options than the average civilian, if you will, as far as treatment programs and options go. But there are other things out there that you can do and try. So try everything you can. And if you want to live, if you want it bad enough, it can happen. I'm proof of that. Okay, uh, Steve, I want you to stick around. I want to bring uh, Dr. Graham back into the conversation. She was furiously taking notes as you were speaking, so <laughs> I thought I'd bring her back in to address some of that. Um, overall, what do, you, what do you think of what we've heard from Steve? I, I believe everything he said, <laughs> and I agree with him. Healing is possible, and I think that's often my struggle with is people come who have been diagnosed with PTSD, and they feel like it's a lifelong sentence, but healing is possible. Um, it's interesting, you're talking about the bilateral stimulation, Steve, and yes. uh, the clinician does different things for different reasons. Um, generally, we tap on the knees. Sometimes people are really locked down so tight, it's very difficult to get them to connect to the emotion. So then we would make a clinical judgment, and you may tap on the knees. <laughs> and um, sometimes if people are overstimulated, then you definitely have to use eye movements. Um, so there's different clinical reasons for how the bilateral stimulation is done. And the wand, she was um, just doing the wand. We, we can buy those wands. <laughs> and it's just a way of moving the eyes. And sometimes when people, we call it looping, when people are stuck in a certain mindset with that negative cognition, we have to change the direction. So it's not only horizontal, it can be vertical, and there's different directions and all uh, very effective in shifting um, that, that we call it stuck, like when they're looping. So, and I've done what Steve mentioned. Of I've um, worked with a psychologist who has a client. They send them to me to do specific stuff regarding trauma, and then they go back to their primary psychologist. Mm -hmm. Yes. Steve, do you have any questions? Y you know, um, well, I've learned a lot just by sitting here and listening and listening to you discuss with Holly and Holly discuss with you about uh, EMDR, because even though I've done it, even though I've been through it, I constantly can't remember. People will be like, hey, what does EMDR stand for? I'm like, hey, you better look it up. <laughs> but just listening to you guys uh, has been great as far as uh, me understanding a few more things, because at the time when you're going through it, you're just fighting to get through it. And uh, sometimes you remember some of the technical points. So, yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm really blessed that I had that psychologist here, that I had both psychologists here in the city of Regina, and uh, now I'm very thankful. Okay. Steve, um, uh, you're going to stick around? Yeah, certainly. Okay, great. Um, we got this email from Heather. Heather writes, has EMDR ever been used or can it be used on someone with chronic pain or complex regional pain syndrome? Is there any research regarding that? I um, do know people have used it for migraines. And um, looking at to see if there's any connection with a past injury and if there's any psychological component with that injury. So there is that possibility that some people have used it and it has been efficacious. Okay. Um, how, how widespread is this treatment in Saskatchewan right now? Um, unfortunately, I would like to say it's, it's uh, everybody can access and call someone, but that is not the case. We had before COVID-19, there were about two to three sessions, training sessions, where there was a large intake in this province, and uh, Sue Genis came from Ontario to provide the training. So I would say we have the highest number of individuals providing DR than we've ever had in this province compared to five years ago. Ten years ago, it was very difficult to find someone. Um, we know that, uh, that there are long wait lists for any sort of mental health treatment. Um, is that the case for the MDR as well? Yes, it is. Uh -huh. Any idea how long someone would wait from that first referral? I think it depends. Like if, you, if you're someone like Steve who has, you know, direct access and they have their own psychologist who trained in EMDR, they probably potentially could get quicker access. But for the average person um, accessing mental health and then someone who has a specialty who can provide EMDR, it would be a, a longer wait time. Yeah. Um, hey, oh, go ahead, Steve. Hey, Gareth. I was just wondering now. Um, if I can make a comment, it's not really a question, but one, ahead, of the, one of the things that I found interesting Holly was talking about when she was speaking about where EMDR originated from was that the, the original doctor that um, coined the EMDR terminology or what have you, she was out for a walk and that struck me as really important. Again, we go back to what's available to people, but I'm a big proponent, if, if that's a correct word, of 
being in the outdoors and healing through the outdoors and whether that uh, has anything to do with the actual EMDR itself. But I, I do believe that when you are outdoors like that, you are really in the moment and you're paying attention to things and you'll see things that you'd never see in your normal day. But yeah, I, I, I found that very interesting. I was surprised by that. Mm-hmm. Um, just to pick up on that, Steve, actually walking is a form of bilateral stimulation because you're walking left, right, left, right. Um, so it can be helpful, and that's why people often do feel better when they go for a walk and they think about something and perhaps they have a colleague or a friend they can talk about the particular event, and it can help. The challenge, though, is if someone has an actual diagnosis of PTSD and it's more complex, that's where they require uh, someone who's trained to assist with the processing and to do the cognitive interweaves. Uh, I'm curious... Um you know, regardless of what you do, uh, you know, for, for a living, um, a lot of us are, uh, we're looking at computer screens, we might be reading a lot, um, we might be focusing, I mean, a welder is obviously very mm-hmm. focused on that weld. Is there something about going for a walk outdoors where, and you know, uh, in the example you gave of, of sort of the founder of this, it was, it was watching butterflies fly. Mm-hmm. Is there something... Are, are we doing EMDR when we're walking in the woods, whether we know we are or not? Well, let's just say EMDR has a very specific protocol, and okay. there's eight phases to it. So when you're doing EMDR, there's a very specific protocol. But there are other things we can do that naturally that, that we're using bilateral stimulation naturally, such as walking. But there are doctors in Europe who prescribe vitamin T, meaning trees, and looking okay. at the impact of nature and going outside. The forest bathing is also mm-hmm. how it's been referred to. And there's um, ongoing studies about uh, being in nature in the ground and the Earth's natural negative um, ion charge, which is counteractive to positive ions. So it's just there's a, a whole study going on, studies going on to actually look at that. But nature will never hurt you. It's always good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unless you're camping in bear country, you know, <laughs> maybe not. Um, now, Holly, you're, you're Indigenous. What difference do you think this makes to your Indigenous patients, particularly, and the trauma that they may present? Well, I, I speaking from my own experience, I'm First Nation, I'm Cree and Scottish. Um, I, my trauma was complex because it started early in my childhood. And I would say most Indigenous peoples, the impact of colonization, specifically residential schools and many other factors that are associated with colonization, they have been traumatized. And it's not just in the history. It's not like it's done and over when they grow up and all of a sudden they're 18, but continue to be traumatized. And I think that's really important to understand is when you do EMDR and you address your past trauma, you asked me earlier, is there any cases people come back? Well, if they have new events that happen, then yes, a person have had a new loss or an unexpected death or a tragic death, then they would come back uh, if they felt they needed some assistance. So I think the challenge with Indigenous peoples in our province and in Canada is finding someone who actually understands colonial history and understands the impact it's had on people's overall health. It's not just mental, it's physical, emotional, and spiritual wellness um, is very critical. And then to look at ways that are effective in processing the trauma and, of course, um, Always when you're doing trauma work, you're also looking of teaching wellness is an everyday thing. So you're looking at boundaries, coping strategies, um, different ways people can integrate wellness every day, not just when there's a crisis. Mm -hmm. And really looking at how can we prevent potentially other types of things of happening by having boundaries and other things in our life and to recognize red flags um, when we're not doing well or perhaps when we're seeing them in our environment. Okay. I want to bring uh, caller Donna into the conversation. Hello, Donna. Hi there. Thank you for calling, Donna. Go ahead. So um, a few years back, um, my husband took his life, and it caused trauma uh, within the immediate family, uh, for sure. We needed something, and we were unable to find, um, you know, therapists, as has been recently discussed. They are difficult to find. There's long wait times. Um, But we were very fortunate to find someone who could deliver counseling services for the family. But most importantly was the EMDR type therapy to help remove some of that trauma. 
and um, it it was successful to a certain degree, and we really appreciate. We'd never heard of it, and of course now there is a lot of info, a little bit more information about it. But we truly couldn't have uh, come out of the situation or the trauma um, unscathed, or you know, uh, uh, without some of this this type of therapy. So what we did, uh, because we realized the PTSD that must occur uh, when, um, you know, suicide or other traumatic events occur, um, it, it was necessary to have this therapy available. So we started a fund called the Johnny Z Healthy Minds Fund. One of the three purposes of the fund is to try and fund or find ways to fund therapists to continue their studies in EMDR because it's not just a one class. It's, you know, over time and it's uh, different levels and it's continuing continuing to study and practice, um, which is what we came to understand. But, you know, I, I really hope that there is opportunity for, uh, you know, whether you're EMT, whether your family, in tra- you know, uh, uh, being exposed to traumatic, traumatic events, um, I hope that this is an option for people. We did discuss with the government the option of trying to uh, move some of the EMDR forward uh, along with CBT because they really quite felt CBT was their avenue. But EMDR is a different different thought process, and it's very effective, can be very effective. Tell us more about the Johnny Z, uh, Johnny Z Healthy Minds Fund. Sure. So the Johnny Z Healthy Minds Fund was started because when this situation happened, we had we didn't even know where to turn, and we are very educated, well-resourced folks, and we, we, didn't, we didn't have any support. We didn't know where to go, and we realized right away there has to be um, more support out there. Even I didn't want to know some of the stats of suicide that I have to know right now, which is that men over the age of 45 are most likely to complete suicide. Um, so it's just all these pieces, and so we established this fund to try and ensure that there are resources, support out there for others who may experience this type of death. Donna, thank you so much for sharing your story and taking part in the conversation today. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I just want to extend my condolences for your loss. I'm very sorry. Yeah, and I, I too would like to add to that, Donna, because, yeah, it, uh, it's... Far too common. Suicide is far too common, and was, I'm, the story of your husband is, is, needless to say, tragic. Well, it, it absolutely is, and he did not have any clinical depression or anything. So when something tra- as traumatizing as that happens, um, you know, you're you're left to pick up the pieces that you didn't even know there was an issue beforehand. So the PTSD is is there's a lot of pieces to it. Mm-hmm. Very complex. And you know, Donna, you Thank brought you. you brought up another point that I I felt was really important. But like you said, when you're finished, you don't just walk away, and and that's a key point too. I mean, I, yeah, the EMDR took care of that, but the therapy and the 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 journey still oh, continued. Yeah, absolutely. The grief counseling. There was nothing there for us immediately. We were either on a list for three months. We needed something immediate. We needed somebody to to help guide us through this, um, you know, this this traumatic event, and we had we, we were just kind of dumbfounded that there was no supports available, and we couldn't get into anybody for three months. It just seemed, uh, it, uh, you know, we do so much at the beginning of life um, when you know we're bringing people into this world, but when something traumatizing like this happens, there was literally no immediate supports that we could call upon. And it was quite shocking. Um, so we hope that there are more resources available, that there's more different kinds of therapy that people need, like EMDR, and good people delivering this this service. Um, and I think of the EMTs and the need for more opportunities to undertake EMDR. Again, Donna, thank you so much. Thank you.
Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Donna. Bye. You were taking notes again, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I just think that it's very courageous of her to, to share her own mm -hmm. story. That's, that's fairly relatively fresh. And, and I would agree that we don't have adequate support when people experience these types of traumas and, and immediately when they happen. Um, yeah, my heart just goes out to her mm -hmm. and her family. And, and I'm so appreciative of everyone who shared their stories with EMDR. And uh, that's part of the reason I came and spoke about it, because EMDR has not been something that's really been talked about a lot mm -hmm. about in this province. Mm -hmm. So I am appreciative of the opportunity. Well, something that struck me with uh, speaking to Donna was that, uh, you know, even in this conversation we talked about, and, you know, Steve uh, very bravely, uh, courageously spoke about his uh, suicide ideation. Mm -hmm. But we don't often think about the people left behind after suicide and especially as we're in a bit of a epidemic right now with yes. especially youth suicide and we don't often think about the uh, the, the help that the sur surviving family and friends might need absolutely when we look at suicide and trauma it's not just the person but it's also their family everyone's impacted um who do you think in your experience would benefit from edmr Personally, I think everybody at some point should check yeah. in with a psychologist <laughs> and just kind of um, look at their, are they living life to the fullest? Are they enjoying life? One of the things we're so um, busy de-stressing um, that we're not recognizing that de-stressing takes us from, say, negative 10 to zero. But to get to a positive 10, we have to add joy to our life. And so that's a very mindful, intentional activity. Uh, I think everyone personally would benefit from EMDR. As I shared at the beginning, I had done my own EMDR work in 1999, and uh, it would be wonderful if everyone could access it. Yeah, and Gareth, if I, if I could add to that, I agree. I think everyone uh, would benefit completely, but it always comes down to a lot of times economics and what mm -hmm. a person's able to afford. That yeah. being said, stay tuned, because in the future here, I have a presentation I plan on doing in and around Saskatchewan, and not going to cost anybody anything. So if you don't have a dime in your pocket... You can come and you can sit in on this okay. presentation. You'll walk away with some tips that you can apply to your life. And yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. Thanks, Steve. Okay, buddy. Yeah. Steve Goat is a retired RCMP officer. Dr. Holly Graham is an associate professor of psychiatry at the University of uh, Saskatchewan, where she works as a psychologist, working primarily with people who have experienced trauma and PTSD and also provides EMDR therapy.